Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Wirecast Live. I'm Andrew Haley, your host and the streaming and product evangelist for Wirecast, and I'm joined by Mr. Bryce Stedgskull, the technical product manager for our Wirecast game show products as well as ScreenFlow now, right? Yep, that is correct. You don't have enough to do. No, not enough to do. Okay, I'm very right. busy. I think we can find a few <laughs> other products for you today yeah. if you need them. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to do was just have you on here to answer commonly asked questions. Our sales team is working on a series of videos based on the top questions that they see uh, come in day in, week in, week out uh, about Wirecast, about getting things configured. So um, those are going to be great for you guys, but they're coming out the door as they make them. But we thought maybe another place to talk about some of these commonly asked questions would be here. And who better to talk about Wirecast problems <laughs> than the guy in charge of the Wirecast All problems. Right. Uh, so yeah, if you're up for it, we want to cover some of the common questions that are uh, we're gonna be, we're actually making videos about um, later. So check, stay tuned on the Wirecast resources page for those. Uh, they're definitely coming soon. But um, in the meantime, this is a kind of a sneak preview of some of the answers that you'll see. And Bryce, you might be able to give a more full answer than uh, we could do in like a two minute video. Yeah. Cool. So, um, and then guys, if you have questions at all for Bryce, please tweet at us at uh, hashtag WirecastFAQ, WirecastFAQ, and we will try to take those from uh, on Twitter. Uh, and then at the same time, if you have comments or questions, just leave them uh, on the uh, side of the page where we can um, read them and we'll just answer them as we go. So if there's some questions that you have or if anything we're talking about prompts some things that you wanted to know and pick Bryce's brain about, then just enter those there. Sounds good. All right, well, let's get started. And then we also have our screen here so we can pull up. You can actually use uh, the, the screen in Wirecast if there's anything you want to like give a visual example. Perfect. All right, my man. So first common question that we want to cover is, uh, what kind of computer do you recommend with Wirecast? So that is a very complicated question because it really depends on what you're wanting to accomplish. Um, if you're just trying to do some basic streaming, I mean, you can get by with something more like a, like an i5, uh, which is about our minimum uh, recommended uh, level of processor, you know, for the basic stuff. Yeah, and definitely um, dual core, quad core, because I think we have a, a, a dual core here, and it might even be an i5, and yeah, I have the not dual been cores, impressed with dual cores. Yeah, the dual cores tend to struggle a little bit, which you have to be careful when you're looking at laptops. A lot of laptops that say i5 are actually a dual core i5 and not a quad core, and they just don't, you know, they don't keep up quite as well. Um, so if I was going to say the minimum I would personally tell somebody to grab would be an i5 quad core. But if you wanted to do more than just a single stream and you wanted to do, you know, they're both x264 encodes instead of uh, hardware acceleration, I would go into the i7 kind of range. Um, is, that would be my personal minimum for what I do. Mm -hmm. um, if you really want to get advanced, you're doing multiple ISOs, you're doing records, x264 is out to multiple destinations. I'd be looking more at a Xeon processor, which is more server grade. Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually get some of those, uh, some of the lower level Xeons at a pretty decent price, um, about the same price as the top tier i7s. Mm -hmm. um, but you can you can bring those into like 24 core, you know, wow. um, Xeons, really high. Some of the new ones, I think, I want to say one of them was uh, 32 core. Wow. That may have been with hyper threading though. Yeah, sure. and with like a single 1080p stream, you're probably never going to use even close to that many cores uh, with just one encode because the frames just, you can't split the load. Like there's just too much mm -hmm. to spread out. It gets spread too thin, the encoding job. But if you're streaming multiple streams, yeah. constantly recording tons of ISOs, like you say, yeah. then, then having that really depth mm -hmm. of, of processing could be, make, make a big difference. Yeah, having uh, that that high end of a processor for a single stream would be way overkill. You're not really going to see much benefit. In fact, you might not even see any CPU reduction over another high end i7 when you go to that, mm -hmm. just because uh, you know it's more about core utilization and paralleling the processes out to them all. So there's yeah. only so far you can go. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. And there's only so much you can split yeah. up. What do you um, recommend as far as uh, you know um, when it comes to processors? You mentioned that the i7, you know, we're talking about Xeon. We're really sticking in the Intel family of processors. Mm -hmm. What about AMD processors? You can use AMD processors. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, in my personal testing, um, I actually had tried a, I believe it was the one of the highest end AMDs they had. It was uh, AMD FX9 series. It was eight core. It was like 4.9 gigahertz. 
Um, and it kind of, it, it, it was somewhere in between an i5 and an i7 uh, okay. um, in, in total you know, performance, I would say. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite as good as, I, I compared it against an i7 4790K, mm -hmm. um, and it was not as good as that. Um, but it was better than an i5 quad core. So um, it really just depends. You know, they're going to come out with new architecture soon, too, that may change that as well. Um, so if you were on a budget, you could use an AMD. It would be, it would definitely be adequate for uh, lower-end streaming stuff. Got it. So we recommend uh, Intel because we kind of consider them best-in-breed yeah, processors. They, yeah, they tend to be a little bit more performant for the same clock speeds. Mm -hmm. And AMD is a bit more of the budget option and can work. Just mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, um, you know, for a home streaming setup or even, you know, an on-the-go streaming setup, you're just bringing in a couple cameras and doing a single stream and, you know, or really it comes down to the encode, right? If you're just doing a single stream, you could do an AMD fine, a higher end AMD for, for pretty cheap because I believe the highest end AMD uh, processor was, was a little over $200 as opposed to the i7 was like $340, $350 for the same chip. Wow. Yeah. So if you're building one of these machines on your own and you're trying to save money uh, and you want to get a, a machine, build a machine that's going to run Wirecasts, um, where would you kind of what would be kind of the minimum budget you'd set yourself um, at least to get started? I mean, you could probably build one for around eight, nine hundred bucks if you went with the i7, um, depending on how much storage and RAM you kind of opted for and, and how expensive you went with on the motherboard. It can really vary a lot. Yeah. Um, but that'd be kind of low end, minimum eight, nine hundred. Yeah, I mean, you could you could build an i5 in there for probably around five, six hundred if you really wanted to, but if you want kind of like just a, a round number. I'd choose somewhere around eight or nine hundred dollars for Getting to started. get to get a, a, a decent, you know, starter setup. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, anything else uh, that people should be considering when looking at graphics cards, uh, looking mm -hmm. at um, memory? RAM? Yeah. So RAM is a is a very common question we get. You know, how much RAM do I need? Um, and you know, you don't really need a ton of RAM. Um, eight gigs is the lowest I ever recommend for any computer, really, because computers use a lot of RAM now these days with all these applications using a lot more, being more media rich and whatnot. Um, so I would, I would say don't go less than eight, but you don't need to go out and get 16 right away and think you have to have 16. Got it. Um, but if you can get it, I definitely would recommend 16 is the, is the starting point. Okay. What about uh, graphics? I mean, uh, a lot of people... Look at look pretty hard at the graphics cards out there. There's a lot of gamer cards out there. What can um, people um, do as far as you know when when considering a graphics card? What should mm -hmm. they be looking at? I would definitely recommend using um, a graphics card. Preferably, my my preference would be Nvidia. Okay. Um, our architecture actually will perform a little better on a higher end graphics card like that. Um, so I definitely recommend it. I I tend to go for more of uh, with NVIDIA's series cards, they have the, the 60 series, the 70 series, and the 80 series, right? And then they go on to some more uh, higher end ones, of, and these are consumer grade ones, right? Um, and so I would say for, for most people, 960 in this, if they're just using it for streaming, would be more than adequate. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I would go for mm. if I was to build one. Got it. Um, let's see. It definitely does help with the, the optimization of everything, and you can use the hardware acceleration on there as well. So um, you can actually offload your encoding to the NVENC uh, chips that are on NVIDIA cards. Um, and we don't support AMD VCE, so that's another reason I would say go with AM, or, uh, NVIDIA, because mm -hmm. you do have the option to, instead of using your CPU power, you can use the NVENC chips instead. Got it. So does uh, with Radeon cards, because that's mm -hmm. the other kind of competitor to NVIDIA um, for graphics cards, are there drawbacks to using Radeon cards? Do Radeon cards have an equivalent of like an NVENC encoding? They do. They use something called VCE. We do not have it implemented yet, but it is something we're looking at on the horizon. Okay. Um, and it, it functions very similarly. It's just a hardware accelerated encoding chip that lives on your graphics card as opposed to um, using your CPU. Mm -hmm. And most um, most newer i7s and i5s um, actually support QuickSync, which is their version of, of kind of NVENC and VCE. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because most newer Intel chips actually have 
um, an integrated graphics chip in the processor. It used to be that they were built into the motherboard, right? And now they're uh, they're actually building those on the the i series i fives, i seven uh, chips, CPUs. Um, so yeah, you can use that video chip in your CPU as a video encoder. Yeah. Um, and that will use even though it's on your CPU, it doesn't actually use your CPU clock cycles. Mm. So it, it it will act much like a, a NVIDIA encoder. It'll take all your so if you have a, a integrated graphics and Intel i series chip, um, I mean processor, uh, more often than not, that's coming already with graphics. So then you may not even need to look at a graphics card at all if you're buying an i series um, yeah. processor. It's definitely not a requirement. Um, I wouldn't say that you have to have one. Um, it, it will definitely benefit your setup, but kind of marginally. Mm -hmm. um, if you were building like a really nice setup, I would say that that would be a requirement. But for a starter setup, you can you could be totally just fine with uh, doing an i7 or an i5 and using the integrated graphics. Got it. Um, and we we partner with New Blue and New Blue Effects, and with Wirecast Seven, we we announced that you know we would give a copy of New Blue's um, Express Tyler Express free with all Wirecast Seven. So uh, if people are using the New Blue titling titles, will those benefit from having an integrated graphics card? Uh, those actually should. Um, I'm not uh, up to date on all the specifics on how they actually render all that out, um, but I do believe that they take care of, or they uh, handle hardware acceleration in their renders, so okay. you would benefit from that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, that's all good stuff to think about. Anything else people should consider when building or getting a computer to run with Wirecast on? Yeah, if you want to be doing lots of uh, recordings or ISO recordings in Wirecast Pro, um, you're going to need a fast hard drive or fast storage in general. Um, there's a lot of ways to go about that. These, there's the newer PCI Express solid state drives, which are pretty expensive for the price. Um, if you wanted to be a little bit more um, budget friendly, you could actually get multiple solid state drives, SATA drives, and run them in a RAID 0 SS, uh, configuration. Got it. Um, and then you're kind of just, because it's separating the data out to the different drives, you're essentially doubling your speed, right? So if you have two, two drives that can write at 500 megabytes per second, you're actually going to be writing at 1,000 megabytes per second, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. That makes sense. Uh, so, huh, that's all good stuff to consider. One thing that I, I uh, you know, of course, you know, if people are looking not to buy their own computer and they just want a turnkey system, well, then that's what Wirecast Gear is for because that actually already includes the i7 mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff. And many of the things that you just mentioned are things we considered when building uh, a minimum system for that. Yeah, the Gear is a great machine. It has an i7 with the integrated graphics, um, a quad uh, capture card from Magewell, and we have them either in SDI or HDMI configurations. And that actually has two different um, solid state drives in it. Uh, one is actually a M2 drive, uh, which is kind of the ones that mount directly onto the motherboard um, and they snap in place. Um, and then one is a SATA drive, um, your, your normal SATA drive. And they're different, there's different storage configurations, uh, how much space you want. Um, but yeah, it's a great system for that. Are you taking over um, responsibility for the Wirecast Gear product line? No, I'm not. That will be our senior product manager for live streaming solutions, Tom Prent. Okay, got it. So um, we'll have to have Tom on here talk more about Wirecast yeah. Gear um, when that comes. All right, so let's stay with Wirecast questions. Uh, next commonly asked question, and it looks like we have a couple people in the comment section here. Uh, we have uh, Carlos is wondering, what is the idea behind our iOS application? So I'm assuming he's talking about Wirecast Go. Do you want to talk briefly about that? Yeah, I don't uh, deal too much with Wirecast Go, but uh, eventually we would like to, because we actually have two um, iOS apps, right? So we have Wirecast Cam, and that came out first. That was actually um, made to be a source, right, for Wirecast. So you could be on the same network, same wireless network, and send uh, video feed from an iPhone or another iOS device out to um your network and ingest it into Wirecast. Um, then we also have Wirecast Go, which is designed more to be an on-the-go encoder of its own. Um, so you can actually be out and about and over LTE um, or your cellular data, you can send that, um, your camera feed out and some basic layer manipulation stuff um, out to 
to the internet, to YouTube or, or Facebook or, or your chosen CDN. Um, eventually, be, we would like to kind of coalesce those two into one product um, and kind of further the experience you, you would have with an Yeah, Wirecast, so people would only better. need to download a single application that yeah. could have either functionality. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, um, so hopefully, Carlos, that answered your question on the iOS app. But if you guys have more questions, just type them on in. We're going to keep going down the list here. What is, how do I incorporate Wirecast on my web page? So uh, I think that is a common question people ask, but they don't quite understand what they're asking when they ask that. I mean, obviously, they just want to get their live feed on their personal web page, whether yeah. they sell you know, car parts or they're, mm -hmm. you know, teaching dog grooming tricks. You know, they want to just, I just want my live stream right there so people who know my website can see it or watch it or I can talk with them. Yeah. So what, uh, how would you answer that question? So there's, it's kind of a couple steps you have to go through to do that, right? So you, you have to send your video somewhere and you can't really send it directly to your website without doing a whole lot of legwork in the background, which you can do. Um, and that, but that would involve setting up um, your own RTMP ingestion server on located on the same server that your website's on or or code on your website that points to another um, RTMP server that you have set up somewhere else. Um, it doesn't need to be that complicated though. You can actually uh, send your stream out to any number of CDNs um, like Ustream, YouTube, um, Akamai, there's all kinds of CDNs out there that'll do this. And they'll actually give you an embed code that you can then place in your website somewhere and your video will show up in their player and some of them even support real-time chat um, in there with the stream as well. So it makes it pretty simple. Um, if you had a Ustream account, uh, you would just send it to your Ustream channel and you, you take that embed code they give you when you log into your dashboard there and you just paste it in your website where you'd like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, embedding, uh, I think, makes it really easy. Why wouldn't somebody stream directly to their web server or their web host? There's a lot of reasons for that, but mostly is content delivery. Um, you can crash your web server if it's not a, a really high, robust package that you're paying for or if you're doing it at your house. And even a few people get on there, they, you're going to use up all your bandwidth right away and it's just not gonna not gonna be a good experience for your viewers um, so you really want to rely on a content delivery network uh, where they spread that load out to all these different servers and data centers uh, for you for your viewers to be able to see that video got it yeah I think that commonly you think well I have a web page I sh can stream video it can host pictures and videos so why can't I just stream my content there yeah not quite understanding that mm, there's a li little bit more that goes into it and you definitely uh, want to use the infrastructure and the companies yep. that have specialized in delivering video over the internet um, okay good questions there uh, let's see how fast this is a common question how fast does my internet connection need to be to stream so that really varies on what you intend to stream, right? And the qualities you intend to stream at, resolutions, um, whether you're encoding out to multiple destinations or not. Um, you really just need to know uh, the total bit rate that you're going to be sending, mm -hmm. right? So you could have a single three megabit stream um, and you should know that that fluctuates. So um, as your encoder is, is having to do more work where more motion is present or less, it's gonna fluctuate that bit rate. And so you need to have some headroom over the top of that with your upload speed of your ISP to be able to sustain and, and handle those fluctuations. Um, so our rule of thumb is generally to, to have um, an upload rate of double your, your, your total up streaming bit rate, right? So um, I would go for at least a six megabit upload speed if I was gonna be uploading a three megabit stream. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanna be more safe, which is what I tend to do, I like to say more like three times when you're at the lower numbers. When you get into bigger numbers where you're talking, I have a 15 megabit stream, um, you know, having a 25 megabit upload is fine. You don't really need to double or triple it at that point. But with the lower numbers, it's you gotta be a little more cautious of that. Makes sense. In fact, actually, I want to show people on um, our desktop here so they can kind of see where in Wirecast itself uh, they can find that type of information. So right here we have the um, 
the output settings window pulled up and this is where you add all the destinations that you're you know streaming to whether it's in this case I've configured something for Periscope but you know YouTube Facebook so forth so whatever you have in there will show up once you've added the destination it really comes down to what you've set in the encoding so if we jump in here a little bit this encoding drop down is really where you select your size and the bit rates that are involved mm -hmm. and the nice thing that Wirecast does is it actually gives you a hint on how much data on average that stream will cost you so mm -hmm. uh, you know if you're looking again up here at the top around like say a 1080 uh, at 30 frames a second well that's gonna average about four megabits per second and using our rule of thumb if you double that you need about an eight megabit mm -hmm. per second upload link right yep. That should definitely handle any fluctuations on that. Um, depending on whether you're using the, the CBR upload or, or not, <clears throat> you might see a, a range from three to five on that four megabit per stream, or if you know not using CBR, you might see two to six megabits. Can you explain real quick for folks that don't know what CBR is, what it is? So CBR restricts the, the data rate to a more um, uh, narrow window, right? So it, it allows, for less fluctuation. It really just makes it stay in a more narrow window. And, and they can turn it on or off. Mm -hmm. If you go into the advanced encoding settings here, finding this strict constant bit rate box, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where it's turned on or off. Yep, and I highly recommend using it for uh, destinations that aren't transcoding your video. Mm -hmm. um, most CDNs are gonna be transcoding your video. Um, but if you were to set up your own um, ingestion server, uh, you probably would want to maintain that because right. high fluctuations in data rate can actually cause buffering issues for your viewers. Got it. Yeah, I think that that's an important point. What uh, Are there any other little tips that you would have as far as turning on or off keyframes or time code, uh, keyframe alignment? Does any of this really matter to your average Wirecast user? Uh, it really shouldn't unless you're getting into the more detailed stuff. Um, if you're just dealing with our presets, uh, which are, are pretty elaborate for the available CDNs that are out there, uh, that stuff's already gonna be figured out for those presets and you can just modify uh, the resolution or frames per second and bit rate quality um, and leave that other stuff alone. Um, if you're setting up a cut for a custom destination, um, you really need to know what uh, the ingestion server needs or wants or expects. Um, really, they kind of uh, determine what those settings need to be. Um, an example is Twitch, um, they always require a keyframe every two seconds, mm -hmm. which is a lot different than this. Um, right now, this is what, every, every eight, eight seconds? seconds. Yeah. So um, with Twitch, you would want to have, if you're doing 30 frames per second, it needs to be 60, so every two seconds. So you can see just by changing the preset, it actually changed that value to the appropriate one for that destination for you. Um, so we, we've gone through a lot of the, the legwork there. Right, that makes sense. And some of them require even extra things like buffers, uh, of frames mm -hmm. and things like that and then of course they will check or uncheck the strict constant depending on what the CDN prefers. Yep. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. We will try to work really closely with the companies that are in this list um, and our, our streaming destination partners just so that you don't have to think about the behind the scenes mm -hmm. settings uh, and you'll have everything taken care of. Now of course we offer all of this for you to save and create your own custom things if and when you need to but hopefully most of the time that's not necessary. Yep. Okay, good points. Um, so one other real quick thing I wanted to show is a lot of people forget about the audio encoding. So maybe we should just take a moment to talk about it and what we are kind of looking at when we see, uh, say a sample rate, 44 versus 48, 128. What's a good sort of rule of thumb when it comes to encoding AAC audio? You don't really need to go too high in the bit rate there, um, but you don't want to go too low either because that's going to affect the quality of your audio. Um, sample rate, you can leave it 44.1 um, or you can go to 44.8. Those tend to be the two most popular uh, sample rates out there. Um, a lot of equipment these days tends to default at 48, um, but it won't really make a major impact on your stream in any way, um, no matter how you set those settings. Uh, I personally go for a little higher than 128 kilobits per second just for my preference. I usually go to about 160, 192. Um, above that can be a little excessive, um, especially for somebody just 
watching on their computer, you know, mm-hmm. watching the stream. If you wanted to rebroadcast that out, you know, a public PA system to a big event, um, and you knew that was going to be happening on the other end, I might choose to, to bump up that bit rate, bit rate a little higher. Yeah. One thing I find really interesting about audio encoding, particularly AAC, you know, as compared to say up here with the video encoding, is we can completely customize. This could be like a totally odd number, like 378, nine mm-hmm. or whatever. And then down here though, you, they really lock you into specific uh, bit rates. Is there, do you any know anything, any reason why that might be or where that came from? I know that the bit rates that are listed in that list are pretty much the standards people always use for audio encoding. Mm-hmm. Um, I am not sure though if there is a limitation of the AAC encoder that requires those specific um, bit rates or, or intervals or integers in between there. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it may be possible uh, to actually encode at any, any bit rate, but I'm, I'm not sure on that one actually. Yeah. Do you know of, um, and then of course the other question is for people who might be doing an audio only encode and just uncheck the video encoding box altogether, is that gonna cause any problems if they're just using Wirecast for a strictly a audio only stream? If you do that, you're gonna end up with a video file that is only audio, right? It'll still have the, uh, it'll still be in an MOV container, MP4 container, and it'll be, you, it'll load up if you try to open it in your default video player on your system and it'll just be black, but you'll hear the audio, so it will work. Um, you could then convert that into um, an MP3 or another audio file container if mm-hmm. you wanted to, yeah. Well, so um, what's interesting to me there that you mentioned is it still has to be basically unwrapped or played back in a video player, mm-hmm. like a legit video player, as opposed to an audio only player? It doesn't have to. Um, some audio players will open MP4 or MOV containers and just play only the audio. It's really dependent on the player. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also lots of, of programs available to then convert and just strip just the audio out of a video file. Um, and that's essentially what it, what they do anyway. Got it. Um, so you can choose to do that. Yeah. yeah, so if somebody wanted to just like do a radio program and they're streaming online um, to those, do they, those streaming players, those live radio players, are they, um, doing anything is the audio coming in as AAC packetized in the certain protocols or do you know anything like would it be the AAC audio that's playing back or is it being transcoded in some other type of audio stream that's like then getting played back with any streaming destination like YouTube or are you talking about like streaming no, music like Spotify yeah I'm stuff? saying like mod- like Spotify or uh, you know I think there's some companies out there that like are podcasting or like SoundCloud and I don't oh, know if SoundCloud yeah. like does a live stream or I don't know if even that's possible on SoundCloud cloud but what would that i mean would would you be able to, in theory just stream to uh that using wirecast or would you have to kind of go through a third party service first i think that really depends on the ingestion server setup of on their end mm-hmm. um they could expect to receive over rtmp and audio and then they only actually transmit the audio or the audio from that even if you included video right um that's a great question though since you've brought this up, though, I think a great feature addition would actually be to enable um, audio-only recordings um, as a container, such as MP3, MP3 or, or something. Yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting. It just always occurs to me, because we, we offer those checkboxes here, and it just, thanks for playing along here, but um, the uh, I just always wonder about that. If mm-hmm. somebody just unchecks video encoding, it's like, well, I'm a radio producer. I want to use Wirecast. I like what it offers me. Sometimes I just want to stream the audio broadcast. Yeah. And so be an interesting uh, workflow that I was just kind of curious to get your take on. Every time I have actually wanted to grab the audio out of a recording um, from Wirecast, I have actually um, unchecked video, just like to keep the file size down. Yeah. And uh, I threw it in Audacity and converted the... Oh, there you you go. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be something like that. It's just on the fly live would be interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not too difficult to do. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Okay. um, So... Yeah, so and then the other uh, thing, folks, real quick, I want to show you one more thing on this screen on the output settings. Under the bit rate, uh, you can finally see after you've chosen all the encoding and added all your destination stuff, you should see, um, sorry, the bit rate plus the audio added in. So Mm -hmm. in this case, you get the 4500 plus the um, you know, the 192 added in on Mm -hmm. top. So that's going to give you your audio plus video average. Yep. Okay. Um, so that takes care of internet connection, streaming. We've gotten to the t- 
talked about some a little more complex stuff on uh, streaming and encoding. This one comes up a lot. GoPros, GoPros, GoPros. Yeah. GoPros are widely available, very affordable cameras that mm -hmm. everyone likes to use. So then it comes back to how well do they work with Wirecast? Uh, GoPros work well with Wirecast, uh, but there's some gotchas there, right? So uh, I've actually had the question proposed to me a couple times. Um, GoPros can transmit video over Wi-Fi, right? Uh, so can I grab it wirelessly into Wirecast? And the answer is no, not really. Uh, <laughs> you can't do that. And even if you could, you wouldn't really want to because it's an incredibly low bitrate stream that is actually was kind of made to stream to phone. So uh, you could preview the stream on your phone. It was like when a confidence monitor. It wasn't meant for full yeah, quality. Exactly. So right. when you want to use GoPro, they actually have a, a micro HDMI out or it might be mini HDMI out, one of those two. Um, and you use that cable to go into a capture card that ingest HDMI and then you would bring that in just like any other HDMI source into uh, is Wirecast. micro HDMI like why isn't why aren't all TVs micro HDMI is it just is it limiting the bandwidth and the bitrate a little bit there I actually don't know the answer to that but I would if I had to take a guess I would say no it's just a different form factor mm -hmm. and because it's it's smaller like that it's also probably a little less robust mm -hmm. um, and so the, the bigger HDMI because you have all that room in the bigger electronics makes more sense got it yeah. um, what uh, so there's some questions here I want to jump into we've got uh, the chats popping off a little bit here so guys, um, feel free, please ask more questions. I'm gonna take these as they come. So Jonathan's wondering, uh, hey all, I believe that Periscope producer has specific settings. Uh, you're absolutely correct. The settings you saw in that example when we were showing my um, example output settings there were configured according to Periscope's recommended settings. So, uh, and if you want more info on that, check the tutorials that we did on how to stream to Periscope using Wirecast. Uh, but good point there, Jonathan. Uh, Kenzo's wondering, will it give any trouble if I connect a camera with 25p or 50i output, PAL, to Wirecast? Um, output is, by example, in the standard coding of 30 frames per second to Facebook or, you know, uh, or YouTube. Do you anticipate any problems with that or what should he be watching out for? Uh, you shouldn't have any problems with that. Um, you can actually go, if I pull up Wirecast right here, um, you can go into um, Preferences, and you can actually change your, I believe it's Performance, yep, and you can actually change this to 250 and operate your entire um, document on that frame rate. Um, and then when you do the actual encoding out to Facebook, um, it will then, it'll do the appropriate conversions to make sure that video is gonna look the best it can. With, at that drop frame rate. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And per, uh, Facebook, I believe, does not currently have a 25 or 50p um, default setting. And that's just because they haven't seen the need for it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but currently, they actually transcode everything down to 720p 30, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, they, I believe they tend, tend to uh, change that and expand that in the future. But um, if you were to send it something else other than that, it just gets transcoded down to 720p 30. 30 anyway, yeah. yeah. And Wirecast can handle that, that up front mm -hmm. with the cards. Okay. Yep. So a uh, good question. Yeah, for a lot of folks in Europe, they wonder about the 30 frame to 25, 25 to 30 or 50 to 60. Uh, Mark, what at what point will you finally support passing embedded 608, 708 closed captions? We have definitely had a few requests for that, um, <laughs> and it's an incredible amount of work, and we are looking into it. Um, I'm not sure exactly when that's gonna make it into Wirecast because it is an exceptional amount of work to do that, um, but we are looking into it, so hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah that comes up again and again, and um, you know, we're, uh, we'll get there someday. Yeah. There's actually becoming more and more um, laws and restrictions actually where you actually have to include closed captions if depending on the, what's being broadcasted, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. in some scenarios, not having those can be, uh, you're not allowed to post that video essentially. So I definitely understand the, the desire and need to have it there. Yeah, and yet even when I turn on like Amazon, like live video, mm -hmm. Amazon Prime, and I'm watching through and whenever there's like, 
files or or videos that I'm trying to watch that don't have captions on them, mm -hmm. I'm like, how did you get away with this? Like, yep. you're supposed to have captions yep. on this thing. And like, uh, Netflix is so good about captions, yep. and for some reason, Amazon, not all mm -hmm. the programs are. Now, YouTube and uh, I believe Twitch is starting this too. Um, they're actually having a live closed captioning built into the player, so it'll read the audio. Nice, um, audio recognition. Then, yeah, and it just uses voice recognition, audio recognition, trying to kind of guess at the closed captions the best it can. Got it. Uh, I imagine that'll get better over time, and, and maybe eventually we won't actually need to, to do the closed captions ahead of time, but I, I don't imagine that uh, being the end-all, be-all anytime in the near future. Got it. So, Yeah, it's, uh, it's an evolving well, we technology. We've got a few more comments here. Yeah. Okay, so good questions, you guys. Uh, next one is coming from Carlos. Have you guys noticed that you cannot download off of Facebook at 720p? You know what? We have, Carlos. We have noticed that. That is, uh, every time we've tried to go back and download our archived files or shows at 720, it shows up at like 360, uh, 360 by um, uh, whatever it is. And so um, that just seems to be a Facebook problem at the moment. Uh, we will, we've let our Facebook contacts know and we will continue to, and I guess they'll fix it when they can. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you're the only one experiencing that issue. If they hear from enough people, maybe they'll be able to get um, a fix for it sooner. Uh, from Dave, I, uh, I do audio podcasts with two Skype calls on separate machines. Do you support NDI so I could bring in the calls into Wirecast without a capture card? Currently, we do not uh, support NDI. Um, we will be in the future, um, so stay tuned for that. Um, for bringing in the but two different machines... we also can support it in a roundabout way through New Blue. Yeah, yes, so yes. if you have New Blue Advance... I believe, yeah, it's, two it's, channels. it's the Titler, uh, live, live Titler Advance. Um, it includes an NDI receiver. Um, so if you do have that software, you can bring in other NDI sources as well through that. Um, it's a nice roundabout way. Yeah, New Blue will pass it mm -hmm. into Wirecast through New Blue's integration with Wirecast. So that's your best bet for getting mm -hmm. NDI into Wirecast right now. Mm -hmm. Now, another option in the meantime, um, not quite as ideal as NDI, but we do have something called Remote Desktop Presenter. Um, so if you ran Skype, on both of those machines in a full screen scenario, um, you could just grab um, your your Skype capture that way mm -hmm. and ingest that into the third machine that's running Wirecast. Yeah, um, that, that works really option. well too. Yeah. I like that. And then uh, with the new Mix Minus, you can even bring in one of the yep. Skype calls on the Wirecast machine and get mm -hmm. an even better capture. Yep, it's great. Yeah. So uh, Wirecast 7, I think, really uh, opened up the doors as far as being able to capture more remote callers and Skype callers. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people using Skype and Zoom for with yep. Wirecast for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, Dave, if you have more questions, if you're having any issues with getting those Skype calls into Wirecast uh, through different means, please let us know. We'd be happy to um, off you know or uh, offer you some uh, offer you some advice or some assistance. Okay. Uh, next, Candy can uh, can download can't. Wirecast by Windows 10. Any idea? Um, you can submit a support ticket. We it works on Windows 10. I use it every day, so uh, I'm not sure what exactly what you mean by that, but uh, I'm sure we can get you sorted out and support. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, worst comes to worst, we can send you a custom download link um, and get you a file that way. Mm -hmm. So we'll get you one one way or another. All right, next question. Good questions, you guys. We probably have maybe another five, 10 minutes here, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, so next question is, um, how do I bring in video from my smartphone? We touched on this a little bit earlier with uh, Wirecast Cam um, and Wirecast Go. Wirecast Cam, we purpose built for that on a local network. Um, but if you wanted to do it remotely, so it wasn't uh, on the same wireless network or local network, um, you could actually use Wirecast Go and stream it out to Facebook, um, or, or not Facebook, sorry, uh, YouTube, um, and then use that RTMP address and then bring that back into uh, Wirecast somewhere else. Um, and it works pretty well. I've done that a couple times. It's nice. Um, 
If you want to do on Android, it gets a little bit more tricky because we don't have an application for that. But there are um, applications. Very, I don't, I can't think of the name of any off the top of my head that will allow you to send video um, over IP on your local network, um, or even stream to YouTube from your phone and do the same trick, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then in Wirecast Pro, we have web stream, so you could then ingest that on your local network through those uh, apps if you were using um, the non YouTube option and. Um, if you wanted to do the YouTube option, you just grab that RTMP address too. Yeah, what if you wanted to um, record something on your phone and then bring it into Wirecast that way? What would you recommend? Um, you mean like record the video or actually record your, your yeah, phone like file, screen? Phone footage. Like uh, uh, actual videos you've taken on your phone. Uh, and then we can also mm -hmm. co cover screen capture on the phone too if you want. Yeah. So, um, video you've taken on your phone you can actually you know if you've pre-recorded it it's just going to be a video file on your phone so you can actually just copy it over to your computer and uh, add it as a media file within wirecast and it will work great that works with standard iphone formats and standard android uh, video formats yep okay yep and then um, let's see, for actually capturing the screen on Mac, there's a very elegant solution. If you have an iOS device and you just plug it in, um, Wirecast will see it as a source. It will just show up. And it, that's one of the benefits of Wirecast um, on Mac, mm -hmm. right? So with uh, Android phones um, and Windows, you don't really have an, an elegant solution like that, but there's a number of apps. Uh, Reflector will work for that. Um, or you could even use the, the USB out Mm -hmm. They make little dongles, uh, MHL adapters that go out to HDMI, and you could ingest that through a capture card. Mm. Um, and on Mac, they have, uh, or, or if you're on Windows but using an iOS device, they have lightning to HDMI adapters as well. Yeah, I was actually going to show this. This is a pretty cool little adapter made by Apple that has an HDMI out, and it goes into lightning into, ah, the, into the phone. So, uh, you know, if you just for some reason, I honestly prefer capture cards mm -hmm. most of the time. You just get lower latency, you get better quality, yep. there's less hiccups, uh, so there's less you know compression and all that. So when possible, picking up a little adapter for your phone, whether it's Android or Apple, and running it through a capture card is probably the most preferred method. Yeah. And you're gonna get the most consistent quality. Kind of follows that general rule of thumb where if you can use a wire instead of wireless, it's definitely the best. If you can grab raw video footage instead of going through layers and layers of different software to get it, that's probably the better way to do it. Makes right. sense. All right, uh, let's see. No problem, Candy. We hope that answered your question. And uh, again, yeah, contact our support team or our sales team if you still need help with getting a file. Uh, and there's the link there for you to submit a support ticket. Uh, now, Facebook and Wirecast audio sync issue. So I'm assuming either we're having problems with our Facebook audio and video sync. If so, we apologize. We will post it again with audio in the correct and video in the correct order. Um, and if you're having a problem, then just click the link below there to the support team that can help you. All right, last question. Why don't we do, um, <laughs> why don't we talk about scheduling? Is it possible to make Wirecast start automatically at a set time? We do not have a built-in solution for that currently, um, but it is being discussed. We will we'll see when that happens. Okay. Um, there are lots of tricks you can do to get it to work, right? Um, if you want to think more out of the box, um, there's, let's see, you could make um, a hotkey kind of or a macro or something on your computer that did that. Um, you, you could do some scripting. Um, we actually have a built-in uh, API, a scriptable API, where you could... You could set something to start the program automatically and then tell it to begin the stream with that. You know, it would get very, very complicated, but you can do it. Um, if you wanted to log in remotely, you could use TeamViewer to do it. There you go. Um, but, you know, that wouldn't be automated. But, True. Uh, I mean, it's doable, definitely doable. And I believe um, there's a company, I can't think of their name right now, but they're one of our resellers. New Blue? Um, no. no. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, one Beyond? Yes, One Beyond. And they actually have um, kind of a software control solution in there right now that's immediately available. Um, where you could accomplish that goal. They do scheduling. Yeah. I think, yeah, um, working with the APIs that are available, when you install mm -hmm. Wirecast, there's a, an OLE COM scripting library mm -hmm. uh, that you follow the, the calls in that um, documentation, you can tell Wirecast when to start. 
and all you have to do then is to write a little program that yep. has a clock mm -hmm. and sends the command at certain times yeah. and then tells Wirecast when and when to turn on, when to turn mm -hmm. off. And there's some other, uh, there's some software, I believe one's called Wire Controller. Um, I'm not sure if it accomplishes that specific function, but it does utilize that uh, scripting language mm -hmm. um, in kind of a neat little package to do some remote control stuff as well. I'm um, not sure how much that costs. It was such just a hobbyist kind of thing somebody made so, at some point, um, but uh, it's worth looking at. Yeah, another option for you is to just start the broadcast uh, and then you can create a playlist that mm -hmm. will kick on at the certain time that and it will do that. So then it's streaming the whole mm -hmm. time. Um, there's also some CDNs will provide mm -hmm. you scheduling capabilities. Like yep. uh, they will actually let you stream to them and then they'll only turn on and off mm -hmm. the stream at certain times. You just leave Wirecast yep. running. YouTube actually supports that as well with their events. Oh, nice. Because yeah, you can create an event that starts That's at specific right. times start, and start streaming to it ahead of time and it will become yeah. available at that time. So scheduling can actually be offloaded to the distribution side and the platform side rather than on the Wirecast side. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of ways to skin the cat so to yep. speak. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, Bryce, I think that's great. I just wanted to say thanks for joining us and letting no me problem. pepper you with questions. Uh, guys, if you have more questions for me or Bryce, please just email us, reach out to us, or tweet us at, at Wirecast on Twitter, um, or leave a comment on the Facebook stream here. This will also be on YouTube, so you can leave a comment there. We'll find it, and we will get back to you with the best answer that we have. Uh, so thanks again for joining us. This has been another episode of Wirecast Live. Next week, we will be back on, uh, let's see. Looks like we're actually not going to be back till the beginning of December. On December 1st, we'll be interviewing Jeff Adams, a um, radio personality podcast um, specialty. I think he's also done a lot of um, work in the music industry. Uh, so this should be a very exciting show. He's been using Wirecast a long time and has. Uh, you can check him out at thejeffadamsshow.com or just search for The Jeff Adams Show and you should find him. So we should be back with that in two weeks. And thanks so much. Have a um, happy turkey day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.